On the morning of the 21st of October 1944, the battle group received orders to retire to Turkev. In the meantime, the Russians had recaptured Mezotur. Hauptmann Fromm had gone there with one company and immediately become involved in heavy street fighting. At the same time, I had occupied myself with the recovery of the panzers at Turkiv, which were not to be allowed to fall into enemy hands. Our tross had been here the previous day, following our forward thrust, and had been attacked by the Russians and suffered casualties. As a result, three company had its first death in Hungary, in addition to which I lost my one-ton tractor and a lorry, a serious loss. I was now attempting to save what I could from these vehicles. In the afternoon I was summoned by the commanding officer who was still in action with one company at Mezatur. In the short time that the Russians had been able to occupy the town, they had even managed to install a 76.2mm anti-tank gun in a church steeple. Here for the first time, the Abteilung experienced the American 76.2mm anti-tank gun with tapering barrel, which could penetrate the frontal armour of the King Tiger. The commanding officer told me the new plan. The whole battle group was to move out under cover of darkness to Toroxent Miklos. It had been impressed upon us that details of the enemy force had not been clarified, and those panzers which had not been made drivable meanwhile were to be towed there. Because most of the operational Tigers would be needed, this time the 24 Panzer Division motorcycle-borne infantry would lead the formation. The Tigers would be placed in the first third of the long column in order to be swiftly available in an emergency, swiftly that is, after first casting off the Tigers they had in tow. Since it would only be possible to move by night, the distance to be covered would not be great, and everybody hoped that the Russians would prefer to sleep. By the early hours of the 22nd of October 1944, we were about 15 km from Toroxent Miklos when the order came suddenly, All stop! I went on a further five kilometres without running into any opposition. Our own reconnaissance had reported strong enemy forces on the left flank, however. The hope of reaching Toroxent Miklos without having to fight now evaporated. The Abteilung developed its attack led by the five panzers of my three company with one company behind it. The weather was cold and misty. The terrain consisted of meadowlands, orchards, small scattered farmsteads and scrubland, therefore an unpleasant region for us with limited visibility, with the mist reducing it further to about 100 metres. After 2 km we saw the first Russians. Those not immediately mown down ran headlong for cover through the mist, leaving all their weapons and equipment behind. My company drove in a single file with about 50 M between each panzer. Suddenly I saw before me, appearing out of the mist, a gun in an emplacement. At the same moment my panzer received a hit to the turret which knocked us senseless. The gun was still not able to fire following the hit at Turkiv, and I had not changed panzers because I did not want to burden another commander with a panzer that was not fully battle-worthy. In any case, as a company commander, I preferred to lead from my own panzer and not be constantly involved in shooting. Immediately after receiving a second hit in the Zeitenvorgelege, drive and drive sprocket for the tracks, on the right side, and then another on the left side, we were immobile and defenceless, and only waiting now for a hit to penetrate. Finally, our neighbouring panzer grasped our plight and destroyed the Soviet gun. We saw afterwards that it was a 105mm howitzer firing over open sights. Our frontal armour had torn and a large hole appeared in it, but the shell had not gone through. My other panzers had also come under heavy calibre fire and we had several damaged vehicles. We broke the resistance, however, but because the ground we had won could not be occupied, my panzer, which was no longer drivable, had to be towed away by two others. In the afternoon we linked up with the other elements of the Abteilung at Toroxent Miklos. My the thread platoon, which had got lost on the rail transport before the attack began, had reappeared. It had been attached to another attack group which had headed for Kenderes. It was a heavy blow for me that Lieutenant Wagner, the platoon commander, was so seriously wounded that his left arm had to be amputated. On the 23rd of October, the advance, which had meanwhile lost its purpose through changes in the overall situation, was broken off. The three-day advance in which we had been attached to 24 Panzer Division 
had not changed the outcome of the battle for Debrecen, which fell into Russian hands on the 21st of October, although it probably delayed the Russian thrust into the rear of Army Group Vola, desperately fighting its way from eastern Hungary to the Thies. My non-operational panzers were towed back to the workshop, working flat out at Jasivani. Every company was naturally keen to have as many panzers operational as possible. There was a healthy competition between the companies, and especially between one company and three company, where the constant rivalry extended as to which of the two could knock out the most enemy tanks. Those of ours still operational were divided up over the next few days into several small battle groups positioned either side of Solnok to protect the bridges over the Thais, and we held a bridgehead at Solnok too. The Russians were very fast moving and often disappeared at the sight of our King Tigers. Meanwhile, the rainy season had set in and it poured down. One might think that a panzer was watertight. On the contrary, water always found its way in. Because movement in the panzer was very limited by how cramped it was, if it rained all day, it was very unpleasant inside. Constant drips falling on your head or neck could drive you mad. The Russians had established their first bridgeheads across the Thies. All we could do was try to prevent their being enlarged. These operations on the Thies were frustrating because one rarely had successes, but had to always be operational, expecting an enemy attack. Apart from that, it was wet, cold, and one felt covered with mud. The situation in the outer approaches to Budapest had worsened dramatically. On the 1st of November 1944, powerful Russian forces advanced past Kekskomet towards Budapest, encircling 24 panzer division either side of Kekskomet, temporarily splitting it up into three groups and overwhelming the divisional command post. Our Abteilung moved up with a panzer grenadier regiment in order to free the encircled parts of 24 Panzer Division. This time, two company was the spearhead, my three company following, then the HQ and one companies. Soon we came across Russian troops following their forces heading for Budapest and crossing our path at right angles. They were taken by surprise, for until then their push towards Budapest had met no resistance. After dealing with the problem, our approach continued along the road to Kekskomet, Suddenly, two company in front was halted by strong anti-tank units. From my position at the rear, I could not intervene directly. Lieutenant Brodhagen's leading vehicle went up in flames. Right and left of the road, the terrain was difficult, consisting of vineyards and market gardens interspersed with patches of meadow and fields. Additionally, it was now dusk, and the failing light made observation increasingly difficult. The enemy emplacements could only be spotted by their muzzle flashes, and aided by this point of reference alone, we had to engage the enemy in the twilight. We could not attack the Russian position frontally. The spearhead was at a standstill, and by radio, Hauptmann Fromm gave me instructions to veer far right and attack their flank. I gave the corresponding order to my panzers. I did not like this situation at all, and now, during a short pause for observation, I saw that the ground was swampy, and my panzer had begun to sink in. I could not regain firm ground, and two of my other panzers had already stuck fast. An unpleasant situation in the face of the enemy. Obviously the Russians had selected their position here with foresight, knowing that on account of the difficult terrain, they could only be attacked by panzers frontally and not from their flanks. The outlook for my two bogged-down panzers was extremely unfavourable, for recovery attempts under fire are very hazardous. Finally, two hours after darkness fell, we managed to get both of them free. This may be easy to describe on paper, but how many setbacks we experienced in the recovery of these weighty colossi, how often the hawsers had to be reattached, how often they parted, how often an almost salvaged panzer slipped back into the morass. That was truly hard work. Now I had all my panzers on a firm road surface again. Meanwhile, assault troops from the Panzer Grenadier Regiment had cleared out the remaining pockets of resistance. Most of the Russians had pulled out beforehand. After that, we re-established contact with the encircled troops at Kekskomet and brought them out to be left behind our lines. We had completed our mission and relieved the division, but the Soviets were still heading for Budapest with no opposition. We had to disrupt them by attacks on their flanks. I had hardly a moment's peace, for suddenly my VW arrived with my driver and Feldwebel Grohmann from the orderly room, 
The latter was conscientiousness personified. He had worked out where I was by reading the daily battle report to Abteilung. It often happened that he would show up at totally impossible places. At midnight I dictated my own battle report to him, and whatever other company clerical work was outstanding. The paper war and the many deadlines for submitting reports were really tiresome. Were they absolutely necessary? Groman was relieved during the night by the Spies, Hauptfeldwebel Müller, who brought up the company's mail, and usually whatever special allowances he had managed to get hold of, such as chocolate, smokers' requisites, wine, or at least something that the other companies did not have, and which gave special pleasure to men in the field. Here again there was a certain rivalry between the companies. The third man to appear was the leader of my repair group, Oberfeldwebel Grossmann, he was probably the most important amongst the company's working sergeants. He was always on the spot with his repair team, ignoring any danger and achieving little short of miracles. That particular night, too, he turned up suddenly to inspect the panzers for damage. He was a resourceful man and could carry out the most complicated repairs on the spot if the panzer couldn't be brought to the workshop immediately. All the credit for the company always having so many panzers operational was his. It would often be the case that he and his people had to work under fire, and often in extremely difficult situations. The remainder of the night passed quietly. There is much I could tell about the operations, successes and losses which we had in these days. In the last few weeks we did not have a single rest day and no time for technical work. The Panzers had covered between 400 and 500 kilometres and were in urgent need of maintenance. Because nearly all panzers had held up well so far, the moment finally came when almost all couldn't go on. For the massive crop of breakdowns, failures and stoppages which now occurred, the available recovery units were simply not sufficient and the still drivable panzers had to be pooled for towing duties. The most important thing now was to restore general operational readiness. In the following days, the Soviets achieved a breakthrough advancing almost to the outskirts of Budapest. They reached the outlying suburbs and then stopped. On the 5th of November, the Abteilung was mentioned in the Wehrmacht Bulletin. In the area of Western Hungary, Tiger Abteilung 503 under Hauptmann Fromm has performed outstandingly. We now lay at Godolo, a good distance from the front line. I had beautiful quarters at the home of a former captain of a Danube steamer. At last I could have a proper wash, change my underwear, write home in peace and eat more comfortably. That did me good. On the 15th of November 1944, I took over leadership of the Abteilung Battle Group at Hatvan. Twelve Tigers from all companies were operational, and additionally I was allocated the Abteilung Flak Platoon with quadruple guns on Panzer chassis. In order to maintain contact with Abteilung over long distances, my battle group received Staff Panzer Wand, which had a medium wave radio. Our own tross with fuel and ammunition vehicles gave us a certain independence, for besides a field kitchen, we also had a recovery and repair unit under Workmeister Spath. I was therefore fully autonomous for the impending operations. Every two hours I had radio contact with Abteilung. Every evening I made my report of successes and requested fuel and ammunition which would be brought up during the night. My battle group was now attached to Panzer Regiment 1 over 1 Panzer Division. The regimental commanding officer was Major D. Up to the 18th of November, my battle group had initially to cover a large sector, which by reason of the unfavourable circumstances of the terrain was difficult to monitor, and it secured the withdrawal of elements of 1 Panzer Division to a new defensive line at Gyeong Yos. We had to intervene repeatedly, rather like a fire brigade, whenever enemy tanks appeared in the area. A new order took my battle group to Gyeongyosparta, a village in the Matra Mountains. On the way I was stopped by an agitated staff officer, 1A of an infantry division, who informed me that 2km ahead a Russian tank had broken through into the infantry position, and that our own infantry had not been able to deal with it. I sent a tiger forward, and followed in my VW in order to make contact. I worked my way forward with the infantry company commander to within 20 metres of the T-34. I regretted not having a Panzerfaust with me, 
But the infantry had had enough of such close combat endeavours, having lost men during the first efforts to destroy the tank. I instructed my Tiger commander personally, and by the time the Russians noticed it creeping up, they were already in flames. The infantry were overjoyed, but for us it was just routine. As we were about to pull out, we were surprised by ground attack aircraft. Their bombs fell between my panzers, which were just making preparations to leave. Some of the men on the open flak platoon vehicles were seriously wounded. How often the opportunity came to pass from this life into the next. We reached Jongyosparta in the late afternoon, initially as divisional reserve. The region with its wooded mountains reminded me of the Black Forest. On the 19th of November, the alarm was raised at 10 o'clock. In a surprise move, the Russians had reached Jongyos. The town had been occupied by a German infantry division, which had fled at first sight of the Russians, making their relatively small force a gift of the town. My tross remained behind while I set off as quickly as possible for Jongyos. The first ten kilometres were covered really fast, and then we ran into the mob fleeing from Jongyos, blocking the road with their vehicles. It was difficult to swim against the tide, and additionally there ensued a fairly heavy attack by low-level aircraft, which took the whole mess under fire. I closed the hatch of my panzer and watched through the observation slits as the Russian aircraft dived down towards us, saw the muzzle flashes from their weapons and distinctly felt the explosive shells hitting the armour of my panzer. They were shooting well, but their bomb aiming was poor and my panzers suffered little damage. Finally, we reached the outskirts of Jongyos. The retiring German troops had blown up the road bridge over a deep gorge here, and seeing that there was no way round it, we went into the churchyard and took the suspected houses on the other side under fire. Soon the lively enemy infantry fire died away. The Panzer IVs of Panzer Regiment Wass gradually arrived, and with them the regimental commanding officer Major D. The following new situation now developed, the armoured elements of one panzer division, amongst them my own battle group, were placed under the command of the regimental commander of the infantry division, which had just streamed out of Jongyos. All our elements were to join up immediately with this division, but the direct route there led through the town and was blocked. We had therefore to go about it cross-country, which would be very difficult in the mountainous terrain. We went across the vineyards. The tigers made slow progress up the steep slopes, sinking into the soft earth in the climb, and when descending the other side. A brook had to be forded, the last fifty metres causing us particular difficulty. In order to reach the paved road, on which we had to secure the edge of the town of Jongyos, we had to overcome a steep slope. The first tiger climbed it with difficulty, but churned up the earth so badly that it had to help pull up the succeeding panzers one by one. This was not made any easier by the Russians having set up an anti-tank gun in a water tower at the edge of the town, from where its gunners could observe all the goings-on from wonderfully close range and naturally keep up a hail of fire from there. We shot this gun down. The Panzer IVs of Panzer Regiment I could not manage the route, and the few panzers which the regiment still had were all stationary on the slopes of the vineyards. Only the Panzer of Major D made it, being hauled over the difficult terrain by a tiger. Some of my own tigers had fallen by the wayside, becoming bogged down in the early morning or later, and my proud fighting force was now down to five. I had three here, while Feldwebel Bornshear had another two a couple of kilometres away on another arterial road. When darkness fell, I was summoned to Major D's command post and went there on the tracked motorcycle. Corps had ordered that the infantry division was to reoccupy the town with our help. It was not an attractive proposition, but one could understand why they wanted it done. When I heard the details, I was slightly shocked. It was ordered that we were to attack by night in two groups on two different access roads. The right group under my command consisted of my three Tigers, six or seven armoured personnel carriers, armed with triple heavy machine guns, and about 100 infantry. Oh my God, when I saw the infantry. They were convalescent walking wounded cases, poorly armed and lacking any motivation. My group would be at the centre of the attack. The left attack group with Feldwebel Bornshear's two Tigers was equally strong, and we had contact to each other by radio. With this force led by Major D, 
we were to set out at two o'clock, fight our way through the town, and link up with elements of the infantry division on the other side. This was an operation which led through houses and a confusion of streets of a not insubstantial town occupied for 24 hours by the Russians, who were undoubtedly expecting an attack. What madness! Quite apart from the prospects of disaster, I had grave doubts about the fuel and ammunition situation. I would have to sort that out somehow. I briefed my panzer commanders, Unteroffizier Gartner of my company, and Feldwebel Jakob of two company. These veteran panzer men naturally knew what a night attack on such a town would mean. Yes, we all knew what lay before us. The whole operation seemed totally senseless to me. I could not permit my people and panzers to be gambled recklessly, even if it had been ordered. At twenty-two o'clock I was summoned to attend an operational conference at the infantry division's command post. It was hair-raising. The divisional commander had no understanding of panzer warfare, and unfortunately Major D was not the sort of man to stand up and speak his mind. My own objections to the operation were rejected by the divisional commander. Corps had ordered the attack, and therefore nobody must dare speak out against it. A factor also to be taken into account was the division's shame at being taken unawares by the Russians, and their panic-stricken abandonment of the town the previous night. I had a talk with Major D, who wanted to lead the attack from his command post. Next followed agreement with the drivers of the Panzer Grenadiers' armoured personnel carriers. If there was nothing which could be done to change the orders, I wanted to do everything possible to carry them out with the least possible losses, for with the force we had available, failure could be predicted. I also did not agree that my people should be sacrificed to the amateurism of the senior commanders. As I did each evening, I requested my supplies by radio from Abteilung 503, which, in order to reach us, would have to be brought about 50 kilometres over the snow-covered roads of the Matra Mountains for like our panzers, the large lorries could not go cross-country. Then I reported to the Abteilung 503 command post, the operation ordered by Corps, with an encrypted message sent in Morse. By Corps night attack ordered on Gyongyos. Long live the Führer! This was not an expression of national socialist sentiment. Rather, I wanted to indicate that we had been given a suicidal operation in which the chances of survival were not very great. Abteilung HQ understood at once, and the commanding officer sent Lieutenant Heerlein to the Corps Command Post immediately to intervene. Despite that, the decision of the commanding general remained unchanged. I slept the last two hours before the attack in my panzer. At 1.30 I made ready, and at 2 o'clock started out from D's command post with which I had radio contact. It was pitch dark, and to see anything at all we had to leave the hatches open. Unteroffizier Gartner was commander of the spearhead vehicle, and behind my panzer came Feldwebel Jakob, then the armoured personnel carriers and the 100 infantrymen trotting along at the rear with little enthusiasm, although really they ought to have been alongside the panzers. Upon reaching the first houses we fired into the darkness with all barrels to make it seem that a major force was attacking. We raked all the streets with MG fire. The Russians had pulled back, and in the glow of our flares we passed by their abandoned positions. There was a muzzle flash to the left of us, the first anti-tank gun. It fired too high and the tracer hissed overhead. One round from the leading panzer and the gun fell silent. We pressed ahead slowly and reached the water tower from where we had received fire at noon the previous day. The flares lit the street ahead of us with a pale light of short duration and after they burnt out we found the darkness even more impenetrable. I could hardly make out Gartner's tank, only the light shimmer of its exhaust flame. Slowly we groped our way forward. We received a hit forward. Gartner also reported one from an anti-tank gun. Keep calm. In the darkness we were at a disadvantage. If only the infantry would come up alongside to clean out the houses to our left and right, full of Russians. We had now penetrated about a kilometre into the town and came under increasingly heavy fire as we headed towards the town centre. Hit from the right. The Russians had set up anti-tank guns in the doorways of the houses. Therefore they were prepared and had let us come this far deliberately. We fired one explosive 8.8 .8 centimetres round after another into the terrace of houses and after that the opposition began to die down. I was running very short of flares 
Advancing further forward without infantry to clear the houses on both sides was impossible. Therefore I called a halt until the infantry caught up a bit. Armed with a submachine gun, I dismounted and hurried back to the armoured personnel carriers and collected up all the flares they had before continuing further back to the infantry. Finally, I found their commander, an Oberleutnant. He was helpless and had no control over his men. Then a brave Unterofizier arrived with a group offering to at least clear out the houses either side of the panzers. Upon entering the first courtyard, the Unterofizier in the lead, he was hit and fell dead. At the same moment, the infantryman disappeared, and I stood there utterly alone. A flare fired up by the leading panzer sank down slowly, and suddenly I saw a Russian anti-tank gun no more than two metres away from me. How easily that could have all gone wrong! Now the grenadiers had to leave their vehicles. Armed with submachine guns, hand grenades and panzerfaust, they forced their way into every house and in bitter fighting occupied the buildings either side of the panzers. We pressed forward into increasing Russian resistance. There was a crossroads ahead which we did not like the look of. If the Russians were so well prepared this far, what might they have got in position up there? The grenadiers were coming no further and then we came to a standstill once more. My radio connection to Major D was worsening and in any case all I was getting from him were orders such as keep attacking. They really needed to come up and see the situation for themselves. I got out again and returned to the command post in an armoured personnel carrier. Major D was amazed that we had progressed as far as we had, for he was as doubtful as I had been about the sense of the operation. I explained the situation to him and made it clear that there was no purpose in going any further with it, because the Russians were well prepared for us, and we could not clear out the whole town with our small battle group no more than 100 metres long. If the Russians had been deceived as to our size and had bolted, like our infantry the day before, then the operation might possibly have succeeded. I received his order not to continue the attack, but to hold my position. With that I hoped to prevent further losses and drove back. The grenadiers and infantry were now put under my command. I had the nearby streets cleared, but the Russians were still holding the houses. Dawn was breaking. I could see the crossroads fifty metres ahead of me. With more daylight, our situation became less favourable. We observed the road in front of us, the houses, doors, windows, roofs. Behind them all, Russians tucked away in hiding. If one raised his head carelessly out of the panzer, a bullet would come whistling by. One had to take the greatest care possible. Suddenly I saw a man emerge from a house and go towards the leading panzer. He was walking slowly, and I thought he was a civilian. I signalled him to approach me, and the man threw a hand grenade which he had been holding concealed, and before I could fire he had disappeared back into the house. Now the grenadiers came under submachine gun fire from the rear and had to evacuate the houses we had occupied. The Russians had got behind them over the backyards. There was no denying they had guts. During this mess I received a radio message from Major D. Advance again! Were they totally nuts back there? I requested that the message be repeated before I acknowledged it. To keep attacking forward was pure madness for the Russians were simply itching for us to draw up to the crossroads. To refuse the order meant a court-martial, also out of the question. I found an intermediate solution and had the three panzers rev their engines furiously and then opened fire with all barrels so that the noise of battle would be heard at Major D's command post. After that I reported that it would be impossible to cross the intersection. Meanwhile we had come under increasing pressure, receiving Molotov cocktails from the roofs and satchel charges from windows and doorways, while Russian assault troops were working their way towards us. Unterofficier Gartner reported that he had damage to a track. Woe to him who lost a track here. There we stayed for hours. Now and again I went out to the infantrymen, otherwise I would have been alone with my panzers. What we were doing here was lunacy. Whatever could be the purpose of holding this area of the town. My thoughts regarding the higher command were not edifying. I was just getting back into my panzer when the Russians attacked. They had worked their way up to the left and right of us slowly and suddenly opened a hail of fire on the poor grenadiers. These were forced to dismount and suffered heavy losses doing so. Russian assault troops were also sneaking up through the side streets. 
In order to seal off these approaches, I had the triple guns brought up. Then finally came the order to pull out. It was 14 o'clock, and we had held this position for 12 hours. I covered the withdrawal with my panzers, and by now there were also Russians in what had been our rear. We rolled slowly out in reverse, firing at anything that moved. With that, the attack ended. So far as I remember, it was the only one in which we were unable to fulfil our assignment. After we had re-ammunitioned and refuelled, my people rested for a while. I received new orders from Major D. Previously, he had invited me to dine with him, and the cognac did wonders for my nerves. So now we could get on. I had a difficult new assignment to carry out. During the night, two tigers recommissioned by the repairs group had attempted to fight their way through to me. One panzer division had meanwhile discovered a route capable of use by tracked vehicles. After fording a river, one of the tigers had become hopelessly bogged down in a sunken road. I had to retrieve this vehicle. I also had to lead my battle group back to Gyeongyosparta to form the one panzer division reserve. More bad news arrived. While on the way to me the previous night, Lieutenant Rambo had had an accident with the tracked motorcycle and had been taken to a military hospital. Now I had no officers in my company. The Abteilung already had eight lieutenants out of action. Before night fell, I borrowed an amphibious car from Major D and drove off for the position where the Tiger had sunk in. The car had all-wheel drive and was especially cross-country capable. It would be hard to believe the condition of the road, bottomless mud over which even the amphibious vehicle made poor progress. We had to get out and push over a number of stretches, and so the journey took hours. Night fell, no moon. We drove without lights and were no longer sure whether we were in front of or behind the Russian spearheads. There was no static front line, and nobody knew the whereabouts of friend or foe. Now and again we stopped and switched off the engine, listening out for the sounds of tanks or other vehicles. One always had to be aware of every possibility. Finally, we got to the bogged-down Panzer. The crew was working feverishly, but the recovery was unimaginably difficult. One Panzer alone would not be enough. We forced the tracks off, tried everything possible, but the Panzer would not budge. I drove back to request two Panzers to assist. I fetched recovery platoon specialists from Gyeongyosparta. On the way, I reconnoitred a better route there. We drove steeply downhill over narrow vineyard paths, and on the other side, steeply uphill, forded small brooks, and went through villages long since abandoned by German troops. The local people looked at us with frightened eyes, thinking at first that we were Russians. Back at the recovery compound, I drove out with a one-ton tractor, which was superior to all other vehicles in cross-country mobility. Gradually the recovery progressed, and I could see that the Panzer would eventually come free, my only worry being that the Russians might not allow us the time to complete it. Finally, the remaining elements of the battle group could now set off by the newly reconnoitred route for Gyeongyosparta. I kept two Tigers with me for recovery work. I gave orders for any bogged-down Panzer to be prepared for destruction and drove back to one Panzer Division command post to report that elements of my battle group were beyond our lines and that the way back had to be kept open for us at all costs. Therefore, Division could not yet move out to Gyeongyosparta as planned. Returning to the site of the casualty, I re-established radio contact and was informed that the recovery had been abandoned and the Panzer destroyed. The story here was that the bogged-down Panzer had finally been hauled free and was being prepared for towing when the first Russians appeared. The towing hawser was attached while under fire. The Russians had not yet got to the Panzer when it slipped back and stuck again more firmly than before. Salvage was now out of the question, and with great difficulty the hawsers were removed, and the Panzer set alight by gunfire. The salvage team set off on the 10km drive through enemy-occupied territory, or at least no man's land. I went to meet them with two Tigers in order to assist if necessary. Eventually we reached our own front line, which lay about halfway between Gyeongyos and Gyeongyosparta. Here a new defensive line had been established by one Panzer division, and everybody now awaited the advancing Russians. My battle group moved into quarters at Gyeongyosparta, and the repair group immediately set to work. Next morning, the 21st of November, 1944, 
a number of panzers were returned to us from the workshop. My fighting force now consisted of ten panzers. At Gyongyosparta, each crew had been allocated a house, and I had set up my command post in the well-kept quarters of the parish priest. Abteilung sent me Lieutenant Furlinger, so that I no longer had to do everything myself. In the other rooms of the command post were lodged the runners, and the radio-equipped armoured personnel carrier of the reconnaissance platoon, via which I had contact with Abteilung, was parked in the courtyard. In the afternoon the alarm was raised, and the Russians attacked. We were lucky and knocked out nine of them, some of them while stuck fast in the boggy ground. That evening we were all back in our quarters celebrating. There was wine in the parish cellar, and every house had wonderful fruit. For the evening meal my crew prepared a goose. Next morning I sent only two panzers ahead on lookout duty. They had to report the situation to me hourly. Everybody else could rest. I frequently went to the divisional command post, also at Gyeongyosparta. That evening I reported to Abtilung some successes against enemy tanks. In the evening Major Fromm visited me, and we were all in the best of moods. We dined on filled omelettes and sat together until late in candlelight. Next morning, the 23rd of November, we were rudely awakened by Stalin organs, multiple rocket launchers, firing into the town. In our quarters the windows shattered, very unpleasant. I found out from division what was afoot and sent four tigers forward. Soon I received the report that eight enemy tanks had been destroyed, and that meant twenty-five in only three days. At Division Y requested the Iron Cross Second Class for several soldiers who had particularly distinguished themselves in the last few days. These were handed to me at once, and I was able to pin them on the recipients shortly afterwards. In the afternoon, in addition to the Stalin organs, there were some unpleasant fighter-bomber attacks. The radio-equipped SDKFs 250 in the courtyard of my command post received a through-and-through -through hit, which damaged the engine cooling system but a replacement was sent by Abteilung within a few hours. Although I set up the Abteilung flak platoon, Soviet ground attack aircraft still mounted heavy raids. During one of these, Gefreiter Bola, an excellent panzer driver, was wounded by a bomb splinter and had to be admitted to the military hospital. After that, he lost his enthusiasm and I advised him strongly, though his wound was nowhere near healed, to discharge himself from the field hospital and rejoin us in order to avoid being transferred to the rear. His wound had not healed by December, and I took him with me to the hospital in Vienna. That evening the one Panzer Division command post was moved further back because the situation in Gyeongyosparta had deteriorated. I sent my own tross back too in order not to expose them to danger unnecessarily. Only the armoured elements remained forward. Lieutenant Furlinger and I had a very good time. We ate well, enjoyed fine wines, spent half an hour now and again in the cellar during air attacks or a few hours on lookout in the panzer. It may sound unlikely, but for us it was a period of convalescence. I went daily to division to discuss the situation with the one a staff officer, and sometimes, if the situation allowed, visited the workshops to put them under pressure. This was really not at all necessary, for the senior foreman, Neubert, ensured that no time was wasted. For me, he was a fatherly friend. In the spring of 1944, he had been awarded the Knight's Cross to the War Service Cross for his outstanding achievements, and fully deserved the decoration. One never left him without being served an evening meal and some schnapps. On the return journey, I would usually call in at the Abteilung command post in order to see how things were going. As company commander, one always had concerns or requests to put to the commanding officer or his adjutant. The commanding officer spent much of his time at corps, division or the army group. Then the OKH commissions would come snooping around, people who never brought with them anything worth having. I had been commanding the battle group for almost three weeks. In reality, Hauptmann von Eichelstreiber, commander of two company, who was currently at Vaxelli with the third workshop platoon, should have assumed command weeks ago. It did not worry me too much, for I had an easy billet. The commander of one panzer division helped out here by requesting Frome that the battle group, for so long as it remained attached to one panzer division, should remain under the command of Lieutenant von Rosen. Therefore I could carry on. This was a fine recognition of my service. 
Division ordered us by telephone to transfer to Infrog at one sector. The move there was difficult because we could not cross a small bridge and had to make a major detour through vineyards with their heavy ground. Once we were through the worst, I sent Lieutenant Furlinger off with the Panzers to the new operational area and drove back with the tracked motorcycle in order to apprise myself of the situation with Divisional HQ, but I learned nothing precise. I reported to the command post of Infra Key 1, where I was told that my Panzers were already in action. I saw from the map where they must be and hurried there on the tracked motorcycle. I recognised the Panzer tracks in a field and drove for kilometre after kilometre. I thought that the advance must have made good progress despite the difficult terrain, mud knee-deep and no exaggeration. Meanwhile it had got dark and it surprised me that the Panzers could have made any progress at all here. I hurried on, more kilometres, or at least so it seemed to me. I began to become ever more doubtful about the business. Never a German soldier, or even a trace of one. If I hadn't had the unmistakable tracks of a tiger in front of me, I would have thought myself to be deep behind the Russian lines. Then finally I found my troops, suddenly appearing ahead in the darkness. Lieutenant Furlinger approached me. He had a recent head wound and was incredibly lucky to be still alive. He fell in March 1945. He had been proceeding with the commander's hatch open since it was impossible to see anything from inside the panzer at night. At the very moment when he had bent down to say something to the gunner, his cupola was hit and he received splinter wounds to the head. Afterwards it was determined that the wounds were not as bad as they first appeared. He made his report about the attack. The company had had to advance at once without awaiting my return. Besides the Panzers, the Flak platoon had been present with their two CM4 barreled anti-aircraft guns, which were also very useful in the ground attack role. The advance gone about 10km right up to where we found ourselves now. They had no Panzer grenadiers to scout ahead, and Furlinger considered it to be a miracle that I had arrived on a tracked motorcycle unscathed. He needed to go to the dressing station as soon as possible, and I wanted the Panzers out of this idiotic situation right away for to be without infantry amongst the Russians was madness. I had a message sent to Abteilung for the surgeon. The panzers formed a hedgehog, and I gave command to the most senior sergeant, then back to the command post of Infrat 1. They obviously felt bad about the situation, and so I was authorised to pull out the panzers and radioed the order forward without delay. Previously, I had telephoned Division to complain at the awful stupidity of getting the group to advance to the point where it now found itself. At midday the previous day, when I first made inquiries of Division, it seemed odd to me then that, contrary to their usual practice, they had not been able to provide any precise information. As I knew now, they had not wanted to provide it, for if I had found out what this operation was like, I would certainly have called it off. It was forbidden to risk Tigers except to hold up a Russian advance or make a feint to cover our own withdrawal. Tigers were irreplaceable, for at that time there were no more reserves. I had sent the coded order to my battle group to fall back, and after it was acknowledged, I set out on the tracked motorcycle to meet up with them at a certain bend in the road where a path continued across open country. The order had been acknowledged half an hour previously. They ought to have arrived in about twenty minutes. By then I had still heard no engine noises, only MG fire now and again from a part of the main front line not too far away. It was unpleasantly damp and cold. My shoes felt like lumps of clay in which I could hardly walk. This slush and mud, hardly imaginable to a city dweller today, was nauseating. After waiting an hour I could control my impatience no longer, and drove forward to meet the panzers. Once again, kilometre after kilometre, stopping now and again to listen out for the panzers. The situation was discomforting since I was only a few hundred metres from the Russian lines. I was glad to have brought a submachine gun along with me and held it closer. If I stumbled into the Russians here alone I would have used it on myself. I drove on and soon reached the spot where I had found the battle group hours previously. Finally, they appeared before me. The situation was clear to me at once. Two flak panzers, not particularly suited to cross-country travel, had bogged down hopelessly in swampy ground churned up by the tigers. In the attempt to haul them free, a tiger had also stuck fast. 
Panzers can hardly move in soft ground, as every steering movement makes them sink deeper. Furthermore, it was going to be another dark night, and the Russians were nearby. We could hear Russian voices very clearly from a wood in the distance. With some effort we managed to get the tiger free, but it was damned hard work. The towing hawsers, weighing several hundred weight, had to be attached. Every coupling chain was heavy, some couldn't be moved, and the mud sucked our feet down. Finally, all hawsers were attached, the panzers got ready to pull, and the great moment arrived when both harnessed panzers would heave together on the word of command. The bogged-down panzer moved a few centimetres forward, and the tracks of the towing panzers turned crazily, but achieved nothing, for they could obtain no purchase in the mud and simply ground down deeper. The two harnessed panzers escaped bogging down themselves by a hair's breadth. A metallic sound, shouts, the engines were shut down and everything fell silent. A hawser had snapped. How often it happened and another flicker of hope died. This wasn't going to work, and we had to try something else, though I was close to despair. It was becoming gradually clear to me that this retrieval operation was senseless, risking all my panzers to free two flak panzers from a mud bath. Therefore I left instructions, prepared the flak panzers for self-destruction as a precautionary measure, and drove back to the command post arriving there at two o'clock. They had been looking forward very much to my arrival, because they were going to pull back the main front line at three o'clock, and also evacuate the village in which the command post now stood. My panzers could not possibly get back to meet this deadline. Division had got us into this mess, and now they would have to deal with the consequences. They had no option but to postpone pulling back the front line in the hope that I could get my panzers free but Division had to have completed the withdrawal by daybreak without fail, and also the Panzer Grenadiers. This meant that we really had to get a move on. I downed a quick cognac with the commanding officer of the infantry regiment as a pick-me-up, then I set off again on the tracked motorcycle. The situation there was unchanged. Meanwhile, another Tiger had got bogged down, although later recovery efforts had succeeded. I was happy to have missed it, for my current nervous state was not the best. That night I was given to cursing more often than usual, and carried on like a slave driver. In such a plight, one could not keep calm. It was a blessing that the Russians at least were peaceable. Had they suspected how it was with us, and been a bit smarter, they could have wiped out my entire battle group. I reconsidered the situation, and examined the possibilities of recovery from all angles, before coming to the conclusion that there was no alternative, in order to bring back at least the Tigers unscathed, I had to blow up the two Flak Panzers, a 24-ton Flak Panzer Ivor Steek FZ-161 three-mobilewagen, furniture van, with a 3.7cm gun and a 22-ton Flak Panzer RV Steek FZ-161 four verbal wind, with a quadruple 2cm cannon in a rotating turret. It was not an easy decision to make, and I had to submit to a thorough inquiry later when Corps and the Army Group received the reports of their loss. At daybreak I reached the village with the command post, and received the order to transfer to Jobagi and report there to the command post of an SS division. I led my battle group back the 15km, feeling wretched. Such a night was harder on the nerves than a heavy panzer attack, it was incidents such as these that gave panzer men grey hair. I reported to the SS division. They did not make a good impression on me. We were provisionally the divisional reserve and moved into the village. I telephoned Abtelung and reported the night's events. We began the most thorough maintenance work on the panzers, outstandingly supported by Foreman Spath. Somewhat later, I drove to Abtelung and had coffee with the commanding officer before heading back for a sleep, taking with me Leutnant Kopi who had been returned to the company as platoon leader a few days previously. We got on very well together. A half-day's work ensued until everything necessary had been set in train. We had telephones connected, obtained maps of the new operational area, and dealt with the trivial matters. Then naturally Feldwebel Grohmann came forward, and we had to make out the operational report and see to more paperwork. The things people in the Reich got upset about for the third time, a Feld gendarmerie report from Kassel against eight men of my company, who on a job to the Henschel works there six months ago had ignored the sergeant of a patrol and failed to salute. 
In the German army, an NCO had to be saluted by a man of inferior rank. They were actually demanding that I punish these front veterans for such a trifle. This report went into the waste paper basket for the third time, but I was convinced that within at least eight weeks I would receive an admonition. We were often burdened with crap like this, but sometimes there were important things amongst it all, and we had to have order. We were also receiving our field post again. Nothing happened for four days. The front here seemed to have calmed down. Another transfer order came in. I went ahead in my VW with my dispatch riders to sort out the quarters. This nest was not up to much. The farmstead had only one room with heating and was occupied by the men, great-grandparents, grandparents, mother and child of the family. There was nothing that could be done about it. At the end of November, we couldn't camp in the open and close up for warmth. Thank heavens our stay there was not long. Towards two o'clock on the 30th of November, a dispatch rider came from Abteilung with a written order. Abteilung moving to new operations area. Tracked vehicles will load on the train at Weitzen, Wack. Leutnant Copper will lead panzer elements there, moving out immediately. I had to report personally to the Abteilung command post, where I was advised of the new situation. After their heavy losses in the fighting east of Budapest in the last ten days of November, the Russians had reorganised and shifted the point of their main attack effort to the southern wing of our army group south. They had crossed the Romanian-Hungarian border, protected only by weak Hungarian forces. Funfkirchen, Pex, had fallen, and there was nothing to prevent a quick Russian advance towards Platensi, Lake Balaton. On the 1st of December 1944, the Russian spearheads had already reached Dombovar and Kaposvar, 80 km west of the Danube. By shortening the front line in the Hatvan area, Two Panzer Division and one Panzer Division had been freed to oppose these Soviets' units. 23 Panzer Division had already reached the area south of Lake Balaton on the 30th of November, and with motorised reconnaissance troops were monitoring the Pex Pexvarad Batazek area and the roads leading north from there. 23 Panzer Division had the objective of delaying the Soviet advance for as long as possible. Heavy Psapt 503 was now subordinated to 23 Panzer Division. Therefore, we had received our movement orders. Leutnant Copper had his job, and I reported at three o'clock to the Abteilung command post. They were all asleep there, and so I used a sofa for the same purpose. Next morning, I discussed the plans with the commanding officer. I went with Fromm to the new operational area in order to establish contact and make inquiries, since it could well be my task to bring the battle group there. Our route passed through Budapest, where we had time to break our journey. In the Hotel Hungaria, we had a room with bath. How wonderful that was. In the evening, we ate at the Gellert. We had no food coupons, but Hungarians at the neighbouring table helped us out. I enjoyed the atmosphere and the friendliness of the people. We met acquaintances, some from our earlier time in Budapest, others comrades in arms. We sat at the bar for hours. Back at the Hotel Hungaria, I had a bath and then those wonderful beds. Next morning, the 2nd of December 1944, I drove via Stuhlweissenberg to Pinzheli, and one village further on found our wheeled tross already arrived. At 23 Panzer Division, I took in the overall situation. The division had a sector almost 100 km wide. It would only be possible to monitor it and fight delaying actions. A stop line was to be set up further on at Lake Balaton, where the Russian advance had to be finally stopped. At that time, the Russians were advancing 20 to 30 km every day, for there was nothing to stop them. Next, I went to Corps HQ. Looking for the Corps, I arrived at Siofok, a charming bathing resort on Lake Balaton. Unfortunately, the stay there was not restful, because Russian tanks had made a surprise appearance in the vicinity and were expected at any moment. One could not say they had made a breakthrough, for there was not at that time a cohesive front line through which to break, 